Oh, hey, Andy. How are you today? I'm all right, Charlie. Thank you very much. How are you? <sighs> Pretty good, thank you. It's Friday. We do the recordings on Friday, so it's end of the week. It's, <laughs> it's all happy. It's all good over here. Now, yeah. the question I ask everybody is, how do you like your coffee in the morning? Black and strong. Honestly, I, I get surprised every single time. But that is the most common answer that... Is it really? I, yeah, yeah, it's the most common answer. I don't know if that's just an entrepreneur thing or if that's... Maybe. If it's, this is the new trend now that it's less of the sort of milky lattes and it's the, it's the hardcore, just black I, I, st I still I still love my latte. I've, got, I've, I've become quite, uh, I suppose, hipster with my lattes and I like it made with coconut milk. But, uh, but first thing in the morning, <laughs> strong and black. Black. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, diving into the podcast today, uh, what is it that you do and why do you do it? Uh, so I'm a leadership development specialist. Um, I, I was in the Air Force for 23 years. My last job was teaching their leadership and management courses. Best job I ever did. And I became a real geek about human psychology, leadership psychology, how the brain works and the, the neuroscience of learning. And um, what I realised is that we do leadership development wrong in this country i can't talk about other countries but seeing people in the classroom telling them to listen to a a, a guy flick through a powerpoint take some assessments write some essays and things like that it doesn't work from a neuroscientific perspective it doesn't work so i had a firm idea of the way that i believed it was the right way to do it and such wood it's working so far so let's see yeah. deep dive more into that so uh i did Oh, I'm always going to draw my own experiences. I got good grades in school, but I'm the first one to say that I hate being in a classroom. You just can't, you won't be able to get me to sit still long enough to be there. Now, why, can you dig into more why that classroom learning and when it comes to leadership, that's maybe not the right approach? Yeah, so the classroom, the typical classroom dynamic, if you think about when you're at school. Now, between the eight, but uh, years one to five, kids tend to love going to school. Mm. The reason for that is it's they learn through play. They play games, they draw pictures, they read stories. It's fun, it's fascinating, it's interesting. You get to about year five and six, and it's sit down, shut up, fill that piece of paper in. That works for about twenty percent of the population. Now, I've not done a, I've not done any kind of study on that. So, but roughly speaking, in my estimation, about twenty percent of the population will will feed on that. The rest of us, we need to be engaged. We need to find things interesting, fascinating, fun for learning to be effective. Um, so, when you go go on a workshop, a masterclass is the new is a new way of calling a workshop, isn't it? Um, any any time you spend in the classroom, if you've got somebody, um, they might be a really lovely person, really knowledgeable, has these great PowerPoint slides. But if all you're doing is sit there listening, taking notes, actually, mm -hmm. what your your brain's not engaging um, it, its full capacity. We need the creative and the logical sides of our brain to be engaged, and that's why learning through gamification, experiential learning, it's just mm. something that makes it interesting, makes it fun. That's going to have the uh, the more profound effect. And can you can you give an example of of that? So, say a business owner listening, they are they're looking to develop their le their leadership skills, or even just develop their learning skills. Learning is a skill. Um, yeah. How how can they make it fun to learn these essential skills? I mean, it's, it's kind of like how long is a piece of string type question because what's fun for me would be horrendously boring for somebody else. Um, some people love the whole, you know, the, the stereotypical team building type activities. You get on a, on a high ropes course or you, you're getting together and you've got to solve this, solve this challenge. Some people absolutely love that. Other people absolutely hate it. Um, <laughs> so I can see you, you're pointing no, at yourself. Really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So things like low ropes, I love low ropes, high ropes, my fear center starts kicking in. It's like, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, but so it's uh, it's about variety, actually. Um, you've got your learning styles is quite a quite a, a, a well known thing. You've got your visual, your auditory, your kinesthetic, and, and and people like that. Well, actually, there's a lot of uh, study that's been said that trying to please people's preferred learning styles actually stifles their learning. Okay. What we need to do is we need to take people out of comfort and into stretch. 
because it's by doing that by taking people out of their comfort zones is where we really help people learn so if you like reading to learn that that used to be me by the way i used to be preferred just stop talking to me let me just read it and absorb it yeah that used to work but actually when you do that plus something that takes you out of your comfort zone plus something that make that you can relate to in a fun or interesting way that it just has a compound effect and you really takes that learning to the, uh, to the new level but it's got to be relatable mm. so um the stereotypical maths type question uh johnny boarded a train at 5 p.m jennifer boarded one at 6 p.m how many how many uh, people does it take to change a light bulb type question it it just doesn't work <laughs> um, you might be able to put, apply logic to it and figure out how and answer the question in the right way, but transferring that knowledge and applying it to reality just doesn't exist. And as re I, is, you know, really, really in insightful, and, and especially around the the subject of comfort zone. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if if you're, oh God, I can't remember the phrase now, but. Essentially, if you stay in your comfort, if you stay in your comfort zone, you're not allowing your body to adapt to any kind of change or, or growth. And what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing in parallels is almost for becoming a leader, it, you have to work out what your comfort zone is and understand where those barriers are in order yes. for you to lead others and, and show them show them where they're where their comfort zones, where their, um, how do you get out of that? And also, I all, this is just from my experience. I know that you can take, you can take those barriers even further, and that's when you know it's too much. There is there is some such thing as putting too much stress on the body, where yeah. you, you stifle the learning and understanding where. I mean, I, I only say this because it never gets spoken enough about. Um, yeah. and but actually, it does take a quite a bit. <laughs> to get there yeah. and so the, the, underestimate. <laughs> so in the generally speaking, there, there's different models with different ways of looking at this, but generally speaking, there are kind of four zones when it comes to uh, there's your comfort zone, then there's your stretch zone, and you've got strain and stress. Stress is also known as the panic zone. Um, as soon as you get put people into that uh, stress zone, their performance plummets immediately. Mm -hmm. There's an old fashioned type um, belief that putting people under stress for a short amount of time is a good thing. Actually, as soon as people go into stress, that's it. Their performance plummets. Strain is kind of the new way of looking at that. So this uh, this graph, that kind of curve about mm -hmm. performance and time and the zones that you're in, the comfort, stress and stretch and things like that. That used to just be the three zones, uh, comfort, stretch and stress. Then they kind of realized that actually any amount of time in stress is a bad thing. So they redesigned it, you got your comfort, then into stretch, kind of then getting into strain. And when you're into strain, that's the indicator that it's time to pull back. Mm. Because that amount of time in strain, yeah, a short amount of time can be good because you're still in that optimal zone before you start coming down. But as soon as you go into stress, that's it. it it's uh, you, you, you're losing them. So, and and because it's yeah, as you said, as soon as you get into stress, you you, you lose performance. Obviously, a little bit of uh, a little bit of healthy strain push for short periods of time is is yeah. really really good for that growth, but how I wanted to sort of dig into how would a person know what stage they're in you know what are those sort of telltale symptom signs again it's an impossible one to be absolute on because um some people will be absolutely clearly obvious that they're starting to struggle other people will have that uh, let's knuckle down and uh, and hide everything that's going on internally we'll just knuckle down and get through this and hopefully it'll get easier at the end um and there, there's going to be lots of different ways in between uh what it comes down to is that old cliche of getting to know your people mm -hmm. um but it's got it can't just be that surface level stuff you've got to know down in their core what is it that motivates them what is it what is the way that they communicate when they're in their comfort zone versus when they're under tension or in conflict because somebody who is um quite direct naturally they're decisive they're driven they don't want lots and lots of data if all of a sudden they're asking loads and loads of questions 
that could be an ind- indicator that they're starting to manoeuvre along, along those lines. And again, vice versa. Other people naturally love things like spreadsheets and lots of information and lots of data. If all of a sudden they're just trying to push through and get the results and not, not take the time to analyse the information, then that's going to be an indicator for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's getting to know beyond that surface level mm-hmm. um, how people are just normally is what, what what are the indicators when they're up when they're under that stress and strain so what i'm i'm really hearing is uh is, is you're looking for just behavior change if yeah you've taken as a leader if you've taken the time to get to know your your team and you know what their natural patterns and their, yeah. their natural flow of everything and then suddenly the the just doing something different um yeah. it's almost taking a taking a bit of time just to go ask yourself well why is that Um, yeah so it's a a term that was coined um when i was doing pre-deployment training for places like iraq and afghanistan is like when you're maneuvering through um through cities villages or even just the countryside you're not looking for the normal you're looking for the abnormal Mm -hmm. so if somebody is naturally quite a quiet person but all of a sudden they're they're much louder um that that that's absence of the normal presence of the abnormal and that's the kind of mm-hmm. thing that you're looking for and i find it interesting as well because when we now live in this world where teams are either working re- fully remotely there's hybrid some some people have gone fully back to the office um you know we're still in this period of like just settling down and maturing in maturing into this new way of working post COVID and for leaders who have been managing teams um, for let's call say decades, it can be quite, it's quite, it can be quite a big shift in a big space of time. And and we're talking about, well, it's easy to notice behavior change if you're sat next to somebody every day, but let's say your, your team is fully remote. And I'm, I will point out, you know, I'm a big advocate of every style, if, if, like where I just believe in a person should work where they get the most, where they feel the most productive. Yeah. Um, so for a leader, so my question, how, how do you get to know somebody with that level of depth? When they're working permanently remotely. Um, I'm gonna no, I'm, I'm gonna branch yeah. it out into uh, the, it's more the variety, more the variety. It yeah. could be very much this is very much more applicable to if there's a hybrid um, and remote for, for yeah. remote working. So what what we need to do, those of us that have got leadership responsibility for other people, is um, we've got to look at time as a currency. Uh, mm-hmm. So time is an absolute investment. One of the hardest things to do, uh, and one of the reasons why true proper leadership is so hard is because it takes so much time now everybody especially the higher up that kind of stereotypical chain you get everybody is busy so that time investment becomes a lot harder to prioritize especially if you're under pressure from those people senior to you to achieve the results Mm -hmm. Um, however when you look at it if you think of it like a uh, as an investment you think the first time you bought your house and I'm, I'm stealing this uh, this analogy from uh, from one of my coaches. Um, the first time you bought your house, you didn't just rock up to the estate agents with a briefcase full of fifty quid notes. Say, there you go. I want that one, please. You can't. Oh, you you found it would be lovely if you could, wouldn't it? Um, uh, you, you didn't. You what you. You met, you got, went to an organisation, a bank, and let's face it, banks don't get an awful lot of good, good press. So you went to an organisation that's got horrendous reputations. You borrowed an awful lot of money at uh, an interest rate that meant for a long time. I mean, you're going to pay back far more than you actually borrowed from an organisation you probably don't trust because of all the bad press. However, you do that because of the results that you're going to get from it. So the lifestyle, everything that owning your own house comes with, mm-hmm. the the risk is worth it. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, if you look at time in the same way as we look, we look at money, invest in that time. Actually, in the short term, while it might make might be quite painful, in the same way as all of a sudden having to pay hundreds of pounds every month on your mortgage is painful. Um, 
what you get from it in return, that return of investment is huge because you suddenly have teams, uh, as long as you get it right, obviously you have teams that don't need you to manage them. Mm. You have teams that are able to fill in for each other, that's able to um, work to their true potential. And then all of a sudden your time then frees up for you to look at those strategic objectives. So whether you're a business owner, what are, what are the growth plans that you've got? If you're a senior leader within a multinational corporation, what ambitions have you got to scale the ladder? If you've got a team that you've invested that time in, got the leadership right, developed them to be a fully functioning, passionate, autonomous team, then suddenly your time becomes massively um, available so that you can look and start taking on some of your boss's responsibilities, mm. make their life a little bit easier, show that you're ready to make that step up and then suddenly your ambitions can be achieved as well. And I think that is a really fantastic way of putting it. And as a as a marketer and an athlete myself, what I'm hearing is, uh, well, it, it resonates very much with me in the fact that there is this, uh, there's a time lag and delayed gratification. Because yeah. if you know, uh, if you know you you put that investment up front and you know that you're cons consistently working and building that relationship with your team and helping them to be the best that they can be, uh, the, the results might not be there straight away. Correct. But with that consistency, it'll definitely, it'll definitely come. And the analogy I always, that really like, it always hits home is, is perfect for this, is brushing your teeth. And I say this all the time. Nobody yeah. wants to brush their teeth. <laughs> like, there'll be some widows out there who do, fine. Um, yeah, it's boring, isn't it? Two and a half minutes of just standing there looking at yourself in the mirror. Yeah, exactly. Um, Every yeah. day, twice a day. Um, yeah. We all do it because we get taught as younger kids, you know, how to do this. And we all know, we've all had, well, I say we all, uh, a majority of us has got a dental story, which we know mm -hmm. is very, very unpleasant if you don't brush your teeth and so that's yeah. why we sit, sit there and uh, brush our teeth every day because it avo it does avoid and we then have the re we the reaps and the rewards yeah. um, like I said it, for, on a leadership point of view your your team just takes over the work your time is freed up and you look amazing to your bosses for your career career uh, career progression because you're hitting the results that you need correct yeah and i love the teeth brushing analogy because i saw stephen bartlett talk at an event about 18 months or so ago and he actually used a very very similar analogy but slightly different perspective but the same point if you don't brush your teeth for a day actually it's not really going to matter two days it's not going to matter a week it probably won't matter but if you weren't going to if you don't brush your teeth for a month actually things start going downhill quite quickly and again, leadership is the same. If you take a day where you don't invest in your lead in, in your team, chances are it's not going to have that much effect. A couple of days because you're really busy. You've got loads of loads of work to do. Again, chances are. But if that becomes the consistent norm and you're not investing the time, then actually things start going downhill because it's only when people feel fully invested in, fully engaged and fulfilled in the workplace that you're going to help them reach that self-actualization and reach their full potential. Um, so it becomes what, what's your priority? Invest in the time so you've got people who can self-actualize, work autonomously, passionate about getting the results because they feel connected to the business, they feel connected to you. Or is it, oh, I've got to, I've got to do this, I've got to send that email, I've got to go to this meeting, and all those sort of things. You've got a team that are capable of working for you. They can go to the meetings for you. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we're, we're, we're bouncing around some business jargon because, you know, you can definitely tell we we say these things every day, but if you're not so au fait about when we, what we mean, um, investing in people, investing in the team, what would be some examples of what that would look like? Uh, that, that, that's a great question because again, everybody is different, so everybody is going to need something. Um, but a lot of uh, a lot of leadership developments. Um, type uh, lessons or you see stuff on social media but you, you've got to praise your team you've got to recognize and reward the efforts yes you're absolutely right you do but how does the individual prefer to be rewarded and recognized so 
I hate public recognition. It makes me really kind of shrink into myself. I can't stand it. It makes me feel really awkward. Even if I'm one on one, I appreciate the the efforts and, and what it represents, but it still makes me feel really awkward. I would much rather just on my I don't know what the dynamic of your workplace is, monthly, six monthly, annual, annual reviews. Just put it in there and let me read it and smile and think, yep, my other people. And this isn't selfish or good or bad or wrong or anything. Other people absolutely love and thrive on public recognition. That's not like I say, that's not good person, bad person, selfish person, unselfish person. It's nothing to do with that. It's just how we're made. Mm -hmm. It's in our biology. It's in our psychology. So we have to understand what it is that that person requires from us. And we can only do that through great communication. Um, quite often, having a conversation with your boss, being invited, asked to come to your boss's office, there's going to be a lot of bias associated with that. Holy crap, am I in trouble? What have I done? What, what, what's this all about? Whereas actually saying, hey, uh, Charlie, fancy going to grab a brew? And whether you go into the tea bar or maybe you go to a coffee shop down the road or something like that and just spend some time out of that kind of formal office environment that breaks down so many barriers and you can have a real great conversation with people that way. It might be a case of getting everybody together. If you've got a team of people who are quite extroverted, they're mm -hmm. going to want lots of people to bounce off because an extrovert gets their energy from other people. Mm -hmm. If you've got people who are naturally introverted, Having them surrounded by other people, an introvert radiates their energy. Um, having loads of people around them, they're just going to radiate all that energy and suddenly become very tired very quickly. So a one-on-one -on -one conversation might be might mm. be better. Mm. Um, there's so much I, I could absolutely dig in here, uh, especially on the introvert thing. Um, I, I've always definitely worked out with my team members who are the extroverts and who are the introverts because I've found yeah. that to be... Uh, the way I communicate to be a big game changer. Um, for example, you know, saying saying about the the meeting with yeah. my uh, introvert group, um, they they will always get to know the agenda in advance, the notes they need to prep, and what they need to read in advance, so that they can digest and prep thoroughly yeah. before the meeting. The extroverts, I might tell them five minutes, five, ten, fifteen minutes beforehand, before that the meeting's happening. Yeah. Um, and it is because the, like you said, the extroverts will come into the meeting and they'll just bounce of what's going to happen. Whereas yeah. the introverts need to process, need to internalize, need to go yeah. through it a bit more, kind of think through it a bit before. And then, then you see them come alive when they come into yeah. the meeting. Yeah. And, because, uh, and the, sim the simple thing is, is that an extrovert gets their energy from other people. So they will arrive with an empty battery and fill up the more time they spend with people. An introvert will arrive with a full battery, like you say, because they've spent the time by themselves analysing the information, understanding what, what's required of them. They go to it with a full battery and then obviously um, lose energy the, more, the longer they spend in that kind of environment. I'm a massive introvert, by the way. I spend I, I, on the Myers Briggs assessment. I'm as far on the introverted scale as it's possible to be. People don't believe that because I stand in front of classrooms. I've I've given talks in front of hundreds of people and I think, no, you must be an extrovert because you do that. Well, no, I understand where I get my energy from, so I spend time by myself preparing it. Whereas an extroverted person, they're going to want to be they're going to be want to be around people to generate right. that energy to then be able to deliver the training or the talk or things like that. Yep, exactly. This is exactly why I started the podcast because start traveling yeah. the world and if people don't know traveling the world by yourself is a little lonely and for an I extra year, is, yeah. you've got to find sources those sources where I can start bouncing and creating ideas. So this gives me a ton of energy. This is why I love doing this podcast. Yeah. Um so the other point I was definitely going to make as well uh because you know you were talking about how, you know, how to give positive feedback um, in the different forms. Um, and then I'm always, I'm always not afraid to give that more negative feedback as well. And being, and being, and it's more just sort of the honesty. And because marketing, I've put some context in here. Uh, marketing is a creative process. The, the yeah. marketing I certainly sit on is a cre very creative process. And the best creative process is you do a first draft, you do an edit, you do an edit, you do an edit, and you do an edit to get yeah. the outcome. And 
the it's that editing process that can hit quite a few egos. Um, and I, you know, I say that lightly because some people like feed off that feedback to get that end results because that's their that's their driver, and we're always playing this sort of dance. But what the the kind of the point of the spiel is by being very candor, you know, just very constructive with the okay. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? I find then when. I do then come in with the compliment to say, this was really, really good work. And this is this is what the client said, and they are super happy. Yeah. And this is the results and outcome from this process where we've gone back and forth. Um, and we've we've had positive and negative uh feedback through that narr- that narrative, it feels far more worthwhile. Yeah. You know, it feels far more of the achievement than me just constantly going hey, great job, to kind of motivate the team when there's no authenticity behind it. Yeah, and that that need to constantly praise and reward and things like that, it becomes very misunderstood because people will then oversell it and it can lose its authenticity and people, oh, yeah, yeah, they're just saying it because they have to and and, and that sort of thing. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm an abs- absolutely believer in honest feedback. Now, there are loads and loads of feedback models that exist out there. One, of, am I allowed to swear by the way? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one of the one of the famous ones is the shit sandwich. Oh, I love the shit sandwich. So you give the <laughs> you give the good stuff, you give the shits, then you give the good stuff again. So you build rapport, you tell them what they need to work on, and then you li- you make them leave feeling happy. Actually, there was a study that was released back in 2016, if I remember rightly, mm-hmm. um, that said that when you're having these kind of conversations, people remember the first and the last thing that's said to them. <laughs> so in the shit sandwich dynamic, the first and the last thing are both good. That stuff in the middle, the stuff that you need them to work on to improve, to develop, gets forgotten about. Um, so, again, harping back to my military days, one of the, one of the models that I used to teach was two medals, one mission. So the first thing that's said is what was good. So again, you build rapport, you bring them on side, you reinforce that positive message, but then you leave them with what they need to work on. So the first thing that they they remember is the stuff that was good. And then the last thing that they remember is the stuff that they need to go away and work on. And that that becomes really important because not only then is it balanced, so Mm -hmm. it's balanced with the positive stuff, but also with the things that they need to work on. It meets that kind of psychological way that the brain works and the way the brain remembers information. Uh, I love it. No, I, I absolutely love it because you, you're absolutely right. It, then it just drive home. It just drives home that uh, you know, as a as a leader, you're you're not there just to kind of almost bubble wrap the team. You know, yeah. you're really you're really there to kind of serve to serve them you know yeah. like what things can you give your team in order to be able to let them perform the best they can be and um, what do they need to so they can support their environment you know at the end of the day there's people who have a work life home life hobby life yeah. you know we, we are holistic complex house plants you yeah. know we need we do need looking after um and uh, in my head the more you you can invest in the team like the more output that you will get back yeah so. um you, you reminded me of a uh I, I delivered a workshop yesterday or a master class i need to get used to calling a master class don't i um i delivered a master class yesterday that's, sorry that's it just sounds wanky in my in my voice so <laughs> i'd much rather call it a workshop it's just what i'm used to uh, <laughs> um on well-being awareness so it wasn't too um like it wasn't for mental health first aid or anything like that. It was just so uh, to educate leaders on how they can be more aware of the, how to recognise um, like poor well-being and how to make, build resilience within their workforce. And we were talking about just that. Actually, there's a mis- misconception, and social media is horrendously guilty for this. Um, you have to be this kind of leader. And you have to be all empowering and transform- transformative. And in an ideal world, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm but we don't live in the ideal world. We live in the real world and shit happens. There are, there are, there are positives and there are negatives to life and things go well, things go bad. And ultimately leaders are human beings as well. They are going to make mistakes. They are going to get it wrong. Um, But there's one thing, there's only one thing that we need to protect our teams from. It's not protection from pressure. 
They, we can't protect people from what the expectations are and the demands from the, from the top. And if we're feeling the stress and oh, apparently you're supposed to, no, because if we don't, if we don't allow them to experience this pressure as they promote, we're not preparing them to be able to deal with it. There's one thing that we need to protect our people from, and that's blame. So we, we need to help people to understand if we're preparing somebody for promotion, for example, they need to understand. They need to be able to. It's our responsibility to help them build that resilience so they can handle the pressure, prevent themselves. And the only way that we can build resilience to pressure is by bit by bit exposing people to it so they can learn what their stress reactions are, so we can learn what their, their reactions are. And we can just, we know when to pull back, we know when to apply. And it's a very difficult thing. But if we leave it too late, then when people get promoted, they're unable to handle that because they've never been exposed to it. But mm. as we're exposing people to pressure, they are going to make mistakes. Mm. We have, we're human beings, we have to accept that. Mm -hmm. So the only thing we need to protect people from is blame. Apply the pressure by all means. Put them under pressure. Put them into tension. Help them understand how they can learn to recognise it within themselves, how to get out mm -hmm. of it. Um, know when to pull back to relieve the pressure so they can breathe and calm down and we can look after their well-being. Um, just don't apply blame when it goes wrong because it is going to go wrong. And I, I love that this is very gone full circle. We've gone full <laughs> circle back to the four stages of of growth. Um, because yeah. like you said, you get them out of the out just out of that comfort zone, being get given those small amounts of constant continuous exposure, you know, you are setting them up and preparing them for their their career ahead. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the the blame game, I've always believed the blame game game doesn't get you anywhere it's not productive no, it, doesn't, it doesn't serve anybody and and really uh you know i always think a positive environment is always thinking uh solution based it's doing ret i've always believed in retrospects of okay yeah. something has gone wrong where it's not this has not been the ideal it's not been the desired outcome uh what, what why has this happened what were the steps what are the preventative steps could we take in the future to prevent it from the future? And what else could we have done differently to get what we actually wanted? Now yeah. I'm saying that in from like, oh, you know, something devastating has happened. Now I use that model. Um, if we've not quite hit the targets or, you know, a software's broken down or you, know, you could apply, you can apply several reasons uh, that happens because as much as humans kind of, we have our human error, there's software error. There is yeah. just life events <laughs> that gets in yeah. You know, and, uh, and, so and some, yeah. Sometimes the reason that things have gone wrong is because we assigned tasks to individuals that they weren't ready for. Is that their fault or is that our fault? Other times it's because um, there are things going on in their lives that actually this tiny amount of pressure that we've put them under in work to try and develop them means that they've slipped into stress completely, well, from our perspective, accidentally. Now, we don't know about it because they haven't told us about it. But again, is that their fault or is that our fault? Mm -hmm. Because if they don't feel as though they can trust us, then we haven't created that, the environment where they feel safe to admit to their vulnerabilities and things like that. Um, and psychological safety is uh, is another bugbear of mine when I see it on uh, on social media because again, oh yeah, you've got to create this psychologically safe environment. You've got to allow people to be who they are. You've got to allow people to grow and develop and and feel safe. And yes, you absolutely do, but it's only fifty percent. The other fifty percent is well, let's face it. The reality is there are good people and there are bad people in every walk of life. So if you've hired somebody who isn't a values match, that isn't performing, that's not doing the results, unless you challenge them, mm. then actually they don't know. But then you're kind of going against this whole social media expectation of just being nice all the time, because to challenge somebody isn't nice. It's not nice for you. It's not nice for the individual. Um, but we have to do it. But if you create a truly psychologically safe environment, then not only... Do you feel safe as a leader? Because you're part of the team as well. You need to feel safe. Do you feel safe to make the challenge? But actually, everybody else who's having to do more work to cover for the work that individual isn't doing, they feel safe to be able to challenge. Mm -hmm. So challenge is a huge part of a truly psychologically safe environment. The difference is it's not done as a personal attack. 
it's done for the betterment of the individual, the betterment of the team, not to derile or to degrade or to chastise. I, I love it because there's two books uh, that are coming uh, coming to mind. Uh, one is called Radically Candor. You know yeah. the the value of honest uh, honest communication and how that is the yeah. betterment for the betterment of the team. Uh, that was very really really good. And the other one is called Difficult Conversations. Now, when yeah. a uh, I'm going to call it a difficult conversation. If there's a difficult conversation that you know it is uncomfortable, nobody wants it. Um, there is there is always two conversations going on at the same time. When and that's how I always like to think about it. So. If two people have are having a disagreement, there's the the verbal of what's been saying, yes. but then there is the underlying conversation that's not being said, and it's only until you take a step back to kind of really analyze. Okay, they said these things. I said these things. Why are they saying these things? Why am I saying this? How I like what perspective am I coming from? How do I feel from this? And so you know you're talking about that team member. Um, you got to again. It's that. It's just I can't take in that sort of analysis time to what is happening in in that yeah. situation. And sometimes I will say, sometimes it, the the end result is that they should be removed from the team. Um, I'm not saying that like we're here for all sunshines and rainbows or anything like that. This is business at the end of the day, and it's competitive. Yeah. Um, and yeah. sometimes it's a blessing. In I always talk about sometimes the negative stuff is the blessing in disguise because they. They might be working really, really hard, um, but because they're just not a natural fit into the team, they're not getting the results. And actually, if they move to the, then find a new job with a new team, yeah. then who they fit gel with more, just on their day to day life, they're going to they're gonna have a better experience, you know, and they just got to go through that, that small skin yeah. of hardship. Yeah. I'm working with, uh, with the clients at the moment. Um, I've got um, all. All six of their senior leadership team are, are getting um, one-to-one -one coaching and mentoring with me. Um, and one of the team had to make a very difficult decision to ask somebody to leave because they just weren't a values match. I, values is something that is one of the most important, it's a foundation stone of any business, of just general leadership. The, the, the values that, that you hold core to your, to your heart, the stuff that when you go against that personally, it's the stuff that you really hate yourself for. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, the, they're the true values. It's not the nice words that just sound good on social media and things like that, but the really important nitty gritty. But sometimes people just aren't a values match. I'd say the, the best thing, but remember, if somebody's not a values match for you, that also means that, that you're not a values match for them. So straight away, you're never going to get that fully productive um, environment if people aren't a values match. Um, so there is an example, um, a, a young, not a bad person in any way, shape or form, just was, wasn't a values match, wasn't producing the results. And um, what we decided in the end, instead of just firing the individual, what we said is that your, your contracts will be terminated at a date. I think we set two months in the future. Said. So in this time, we'll provide you with the opportunity to go to job interviews, to do what you need to do. And actually, the, so the, the, the deed was done on the Friday afternoon. When the individual came back on the Monday, a completely different person. Suddenly, it looked, it looked like a weight had been lifted off this lad's shoulders mm -hmm. because suddenly he, he was no longer being expected to come to this environment where he just didn't fit. Mm. so and so people know that when they don't fit we know that but mm. because um there are so many pressures on us that we we've got a, a kind of old-fashioned working man's attitude that you just got to knuckle down and push through and things like that by 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 being in, told that actually you're not a values man you're not we're not a right fit but we're not just going to put you under a, a massive amount of, of stress and just sack you and kind of ruin your life we're going to give you time to go and find a solution that is going to work for you then it was just a game changer. And actually, ironically, his performance has improved massively um, to, to such a degree that, the, uh, that his boss is thinking, did I actually make the right decision here? Um, but again, it's, be it's because that pressure has just been lifted off his shoulder. He's got an opportunity now to find something that is a better match for him. I'm, I'm going to, we're going to have to sort of leave it on that note, but I feel, you know, we have really covered a lot of topics for, for leadership and, 
you know, even if take uh, somebody is able to take just a slither of today, it will really help. Uh, I'm, you know, we've talked a lot about managing teams. Um, I do, I do believe in uh, that leadership goes wider than that. It goes mm. your know, communication around your friends, your family, just people that you meet on the in the street, and and kind of that attitude and behaviors yourself. Yeah. Um, so finally, what is one thing that a person can buy from you that is under a hundred pounds that would add a ton of value to their lives? So the the biggest thing that I can recommend is a disc profile. Disc profile is fifty pounds plus VAT. Uh, you get a fifteen page report that shows you exactly what your personality profile is, uh, what it means, how to recognise other traits, but also then the the bit that I love in the fifteen page report is page thirteen. You got three charts your natural self, yourself under pressure, but then how you're behaving right now. If all of those three, you're never going to get them identical. But if you've got all three that are a fairly similar sort of sort of shape, then you know you're just it, in the best place possible. But if there's a difference between any of them, then that suggests that maybe you're in an environment that's not getting the best out of you or isn't the best environment for you. Um, and it can be a game changer. But not only for that self-recognition, but also then to learn how to communicate with other people in a much better, much more powerful way. It's a game changer for, for leaders to get to understand how to speak to their people. That's perfect. You, again, yeah. back, back to the start on understanding yourself will help you understand others and Absolutely. be able to increase performance. So thank you yeah. so much, Andy. Thank you so much You're for your welcome. time. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we hope yeah. we do an episode two because I'm yeah, sure. Always, always. Always. I hope, hopefully, your listeners listeners have got have got plenty from it as well. <laughs> Amazing. Speak to you yeah. soon. Bye. Take care.